Hello everyone and welcome to this new edition of Echo Africa, the environment magazine brought to you by NTV in Uganda, DW in Germany and Nigeria's own channels television. I am Chris Alems coming to you from Lagos. Today we'll be crisscrossing the African continent and also checking out a new conservation project in Germany. That is true, Chris, and one of those projects is generating a lot of buzz. You will see what I mean in a bit. I am Sandra Twinovdi with a warm welcome from Kampala here in Uganda. Let us take a look at what we've got in store for you today. What can we do when agriculture doesn't produce enough food? In Nairobi, Kenya, people are coming up with solutions. And South African farmers are embracing more sustainable farming with the help of sweet and friendly creatures from abroad. If we want to ensure the well-being of people on our planet, protecting resources and food security are key. Whether it is water, land or biodiversity, every loss leads to imbalance, however minor it may seem. Extreme weather events in the countryside, for example, can lead to food shortages in cities. And with more people moving to urban centers, the pressure to provide food for the growing populations is increasing. Now, an Africa-wide initiative aims to get things growing in the cities themselves. Here is an example from Nairobi. <laughs> A forest of vegetables thriving in a small courtyard. Vertical farming makes it possible. Could this improve food security in urban Kenya? La Vintao Cage grows producing vertical planting sacks on a small farm in Kitengela, on the outskirts of Nairobi. She cultivates spinach and kale for both household consumption and for sale. It's what was so interesting about it is how like you can find one sack can hold up to 150 plants. So that one was a bit econ economical for me. And uh, it, it's something that if you lay it down, it can cover like a big space. But here you see it has just taken a small space, but the plants are many. She uses less water and spends less time and money on weeding. She was introduced to the new method by Miriwa Maita of Urban Green Farm. The organization sells vertical farming bags to interested parties and has also teamed up with local NGOs to set up gardens in informal settlements on the compact spaces available in urban areas. Mostly what we do, we help mostly people to, to set up their kitchen garden using the small space that they have and also the balconies. That is, we are trying to help people to embrace urban farming. Uh, because mostly people are moving to the urban areas and uh, they cannot be able to access uh, healthy vegetables. Wamaita was trained by the African Association for Vertical Farming. The non-profit initiative helps to promote climate-friendly agricultural practices. The association's Kenya coordinator, Peter Yateng, runs training courses for young people. Some of the techniques that we work with are vertical gardens, uh, hydroponics, aquaponics, and aeroponics. So basically, uh, we see the youth as the future of Africa. And also the women take a very big uh, portion of climate, uh, of food security in Africa. So we see that if we empower these two, the, Africa, we, the, the, the food security will take taken to the next level. Over the last three years, the association has trained more than 1,500 women and young people around Kenya. The courses cover everything from crop management and watering techniques to pest control and the use of biofertilizers. Vertical Gardens has its own training facility. Here, emphasis is placed on ways of saving the planet from carbon emissions and excessive energy use. People are encouraged to grow food close to home to help cut down the use of fuel during transportation. If I can grow it myself, then it's better for me, it's better for the environment as a whole. We reduce the amount of cars on the road, the amount of carbon emissions, the amount of transport needed from the supplier to come to the supermarket, from the supermarket paying a hefty uh, electricity bill in terms of power and, and refrigeration services. Food security is a major problem in Kenya. Produce losses often reach up to 50% due to post-harvest storage problems. 
An initiative called the G-Star Youth Group came up with a way to help banana growers get more value for their products and cut down on wastage. They also pay three times more per bunch than brokers. The fresh bananas are dried, crushed and processed into a fortified flour, a product that fetches good prices, which also means more money for the farmers. Using the model we have for bananas, this can also be used in different food types of food. So this can improve their food security and the food storage. So the issue of hunger will be eliminated. The issue of food waste will be eliminated. The issue of farmers going to at a loss to also be eliminated. G-Star now wants to increase its drying and storage areas to accommodate more bananas. It also wants to start milling in bulk and expand sales nationwide. The flour can be used or stored for several months. And as for Lavinta Okage, her vertical farm is doing so well, she's already thinking about adding more vegetable varieties. One of the many advantages of vertical farms is that they aren't dependent on natural pollinators. But there is still plenty of food grown in the great outdoors. And for that, we still need help from insects like the butterflies and the bees. But colony collapse is a serious problem around the world. An environmentally friendly solution is really needed. And this week's Doing a Bit is definitely a step in the right direction. It's the same distressing sight year after year. When varroa mites infiltrate a bee colony, the result is devastating. In response, many beekeepers treat their hives with formic acid. It kills off the parasites, but it also causes some bees to tear out their own antennae. So industrial designer Philip Pothast and a few of his friends wanted to see if they could solve the problem in a more natural way. We found research studies that outline how bees create hives in nature. Colonies do very well in tree hollows. They even manage to keep the varroa mites at bay without the need for formic acid. The team constructed an artificial tree hollow from recycled plastic. Lined with hemp wool and clay, the honeycomb sits on top. The dry climate inside is not favorable to the mites, so they stay away. After a year of testing, the time has come to move the bees into their new home. The project has been financed through EU funding so far, but the inventors have applied for a patent. We definitely want to start a company at some point. Our aim is to help solve a problem, and we think that will only really work if our idea is backed by a business model that can support itself. Now they want to set up a crowdfunding campaign to enable them to go into mass production. Until now, they've been making the hives on a 3D printer in Philip Pothast's kitchen. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Here at EcoAfrica, we've talked about how electric mobility can be better for the environment. But here's something new, an entire motorsport series featuring electric vehicles raising awareness about climate change and its consequences. It's called Extreme E and it holds races in the most extreme places on Earth, in the desert, at the ocean, even on Antarctica's ice. So what can motor racing do for the environment in Africa? To find out, we went along to a race held against the backdrop of a salt lake on Senegal's Atlantic coast. Lac Rose, located just behind Senegal's Atlantic coast. Under the daytime sun, its surface turns a beguiling pink color due to the mass of algae that thrive in the lake's high salt content. This is one of the locations chosen for a rather unique motor racing event, the Extreme E-Series, launched to raise awareness about critical environmental issues. You use the area as a platform to inform about um, the different plights that our ocean 
globally is, is being faced with. Recently, electric off-roaders descended on the beach and dunes here for the second race in the Extreme E series. It's one of five regions chosen around the globe that are under acute strain from climate change. The cars are fitted with 550 horsepower motors powered by a specially developed hydrogen fuel cell. So the emissions in this case comprise just water. The area around the lake is blighted by waste. Animals have less and less land to graze on. The villages between the sea and the lake are putting a burden on the local environment. As part of the racing event, the organizers make an effort to help local residents. The idea was to build a sustainability project. So the communities were involved on the get-go. And the idea is for them to be able to impulse and keep changing their uh, own neighborhood and community. So they are in charge. They are at the steering wheel. After the race, the event organizers take a trip down the river, but not for pleasure. The project also includes a mangrove planting campaign. They've teamed up with Senegalese NGO Ocean Yam and local fishermen to create what will be a huge mangrove forest stretching from Lac Rose to the sea. I am planting mangroves to ensure that biodiversity continues and that small fish have a place to feed on before they go out into the ocean and to just help the local community. The plan is to plant one million seedlings paid for by the Extreme E team. Recent decades have seen immense damage to the habitats of seabirds, insects and fish, while fishermen's holes have continued to fall. We saw how the majority of the mangroves in Senegal disappeared in the wake of the great drought of 1969 and 1970. And now we want to use the plants to help nature to recover, so that it can secure the livelihoods of fishers. Meanwhile, it's life as usual in the nearby town of Niaga. Few have taken notice of the pro-conservation off-road race and would in any case prefer to see financial support. Just think, we're basically around the corner from Lac Rose. But I don't think the organizers have provided any money here for schools or healthcare facilities. Normally the first thing would be to think of the local infrastructure. But as far as I know, that's not happening. The priority for the event organizers, among them former motor racing champion Nico Rosberg, is raising global awareness. The races are held at places where the effects of climate change are especially harsh, in desert regions, coastal areas and the Arctic Circle. The project's partners hope the race and planting scheme here will have a long-lasting positive impact. Next, it's off to Albania. This country in southeastern Europe suffers from a number of environmental problems. Contaminated air and untreated wastewater are two of the more challenging. The poor conditions have even prompted some Albania farmers to migrate to Italy in search of better circumstances. Now, a local initiative is hoping to offer an eco-friendly solution that will make it easier for families to stay home. Alcyon Lama takes lots of photos. The mountains of northeastern Albania are so beautiful. He works for PPNEA, the country's largest environmental NGO. He promotes sustainable farming practices for the sake both of nature and local people, so they can make a decent living and choose not to leave. This is the Koritnik Massif. At its foot, Zia Keshi has a market garden. He grows fruit. His operation could inspire others to follow suit, especially young people. He cultivates berries. Traditionally, people gathered wild ones in the mountains. And if uh, there are, let's say, plantations... Olsion Lama says such market gardens could be a fruitful source of income for more families around here. Zia Keshi worked for several years in Italy. He saved up some money, came home and began farming. He started with aronia berries five years ago, before branching out. His venture is proving to be a success. In July, his products were certified as organic by an agency in Germany. And that's something he's very proud of. 
I don't use fertilizer. Everything is just the same as up in the mountains, the bacteria in the soil and the humus. They make the plants strong. Keshi doesn't need to do any marketing. Customers come to him to buy his produce. He's been experimenting with a number of crops. Red love apples, for example. They're a recent cultivar with red flesh, resistant to disease. And goji berries from China. They thrive here too. Keshi also sells cuttings to those who want to emulate him. Asian Lama would love to see others do precisely that. He collaborates with local foresters, veterinarians and agronomists. They advise smallhold farmers in the mountains, for example, on how to get a bank loan, purchase livestock or set up a market garden. The Korab Koretnik Nature Park is a lovely place to hike. But visitors are few and far between because of the pandemic, lockdowns and travel restrictions. The people and flocks who live here are pretty much alone. Amri Fida is a shepherd. He has a hard time making a living, but unlike many of his contemporaries who go abroad, he wants to stay. Osion Lama often comes up here to the mountain pastures to talk to the locals, find out what problems they face and help work on solutions. They say it's getting harder and harder to find places for their flocks to graze. The numbers of the sheep is decreasing every year and uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, the shrubs have taken over the pasture lands, the pasture area, which is uh, the main problem, that they are losing uh, a significant part of the, of the pasture. It's a vicious circle. Amri's family spends the summer months up in the mountains. They spend the winter down in the village. Amri's mother doesn't need to worry about her son. He learnt everything he knows from her. He knows he doesn't lead a comfortable life like people in the city. But he also knows that he has a lot more than his family did a hundred years ago. Of course I would like to have a big car. But you have to make a choice. If you love this kind of life up here, as I do, then you can't go and live in a big city. Still, it's tough tending sheep or growing crops here. And our aim for the next year is that uh, we need to, let's say, support these activities and these families in order that they can, let's say, profit from the from this activity that they are doing. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the main the main thing. Mm -hmm. Amri Fida's family seem to be content with their lives. They recently built a new house next to their old one. Things have been improving from one generation to the next. Olsion Lama heads off to visit another family. He receives a warm welcome. The eldest son works in Sweden, but he's stuck at home because of the pandemic. Olsion Lama says the government has to realize that more and more people will leave unless things improve. One issue is the infrastructure. The roads in the mountains are poor. Uh, government, he says, should uh, give help. Tradition is all well and good, but what should we do if we can't sell what we make? The nearest dairy is 50 kilometers away, and there are no government guarantees. We get no government support. So it's hard to maintain tradition. It's often easier to make money abroad than to continue farming here. The area might be beautiful, but without jobs or prospects, young people will continue to go away, far away. Our next report is about some relatively new arrivals to the African continent, originally from the South American Andes. These woolly four-legged creatures have managed to settle in nicely in some farms in South Africa. 
Yes, they have crease and not only that, they prove to be surprisingly helpful. They perform a lot of useful tasks in the yard and garden and they also generously provide their owners something luxurious to keep them warm when temperatures drop and I hear they are friendly too. These happy grazers weren't part of the original plan for this property, but today it's hard to imagine the place without them. Their eating and pooping boosts biodiversity and promotes soil health. Hello, George. Hello, Freddie. Hello, LT. When Paula Disbury bought this old pear farm, the quality of the soil was very poor, so she decided to acquire some animals to help rejuvenate the earth. Basically, the alpaca, along with the, the hens, along with the rabbits that we now also have, they are helping us heal our soil. Because after all of those years of pear farming, our soil was really dead. There was very little insect life, very little animal life, very little other uh, plants were able to thrive. And now we're putting all of those nutrients back in the soil from our, what we call our celebrity animals. Alpaca droppings, also known as alpaca beans, are rich in nitrogen and potassium, an ideal fertilizer for the vegetable patch. Then we've got our herbs. We've got about 20 varieties of, of herbs on the property. Here's some, some thyme, super pungent, and then some different edible, edible flowers that we're growing. Disbury says she was inspired to practice permaculture and regenerative agriculture during South Africa's first lockdown in 2020 her interest grew after watching documentaries on climate change and organic farming. Pear farming requires huge amounts of uh, herbicides and pesticides and we didn't want to spray. Um, so we thought, how can we use this space better? And we weren't sure whether we were going to have food security. So we decided to grow veggies in between the rows of pears and up the, the pears, using the pears uh, as a trellis. And it grew from there. Alpacas are also part of the landscape at this farm in town of Wellington. Gavin Lindhorst was the first to import the species to South Africa from its native South America just over two decades ago. Back then there were only a few dozen alpacas in the country. Today their number has grown to almost 1,500. Breeder mm, Gavin Lindhorst has long been convinced of their virtues. What? They poo in middens. Um, and that can be picked up and then made into a, an organic compost. And when we had our tree nursery, we used that to fertilize the trees in the small bags. And they also used for guiding sheep. Um, they, the eyesight and the hearing is very good. And so a lot of farmers in the Eastern Cape are using the alpacas for that. When it comes to organic farming, diversification is key. Paula Disbury has made a deal with local restaurants. She delivers fresh produce and also collects their organic wastes. Restaurant's owner Nadine Rogenbach says it's a win-win situation. So we are happy to do that as it's a good thing to just save all the wastage that we would throw away for them on their farm. They can still use it. Farm manager Mwila Kambulu Bodri prepares the waste for worms to eat and turn into composts. The more uh, eggshell, if I want, I break it, but sometimes it's not necessary because I can use those eggshells also for the garden. Look at the way they are here, just one end. Look, they are very happy, they are breeding. The end result is a natural fertilizer known as warm tea. Badri says the model can be replicated anywhere to grow organic food and there seems to be a market for it. I think everyone during lockdown has, has taken perhaps more interest in their health and their nutritional well-being. And I think now is a time we have a window of opportunity where small businesses like this are becoming more sought after. And I see that because I started with no customers and now I have nearly 100. Well, they might be a little less happy to be shown than when they are left in peace to graze, alpacas are also used for their wool. It's still a small-scale industry here in South Africa, but as the popularity of the animals increases, demand for their high-quality, soft and silky fleece is likely to soar too. 
That's all for this edition of Echo Africa. We hope you found today's stories inspiring. If you're doing something to protect the environment, let us know. For now, it's goodbye from me, Chris Alems, in Lagos, Nigeria. See you next week. Sandra. Thank you, Chris. And to all of you, our viewers out there, do not forget you can always get in touch with us on our social media platforms. I am Sandra Twinoblio signing off from Kampala here in Uganda. See you soon and take care.